So let's take a look at more calculus. We're doing limits this time. This is part three. And we're going to look at limits of polynomials as they go towards infinity and negative infinity, first of all. Now, if you're in my grade 11 honors class, we did something like this earlier in the year as some extra material. Uh, so I'm going to review it again with you now and then extend it. The first thing I'd like you to take a look at here is how we can calculate the limit as x approaches to infinity of a polynomial where x is raised to the power of like 1, 2, 3, 4, or so on. So really what I'm asking you is to look at these types of graphs. y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, y equals x to the power of 4. And tell me what happens when x goes really, really large. You can use your graphing calculator if you wish, but I think hopefully you'll see that these, as x goes really, really large, well, you'll see that the y value actually goes really, really big as well. So in this case, what happens is for any value of n, where n is a whole number, the limit as x approaches to infinity of x to the power n is just infinity itself. Right? All of these y values go up, 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 and away. Now, it's a little bit different for uh, negative infinity. So now I'm saying, hey, what happens when I'm going negative infinity? That's over here. Down there. This one's up. This one's down. This one's up. So notice for values of n, which are even, that's the x squared and x to the power of 4, notice how those values, when x is approaching negative infinity, yes, the answer is still infinity. So the y value is infinity. Yet for the odd powers of n, 1, 3, 5, and so on, notice that the graph goes toward negative infinity. So that's one particular difference between uh, the values of n that you need to worry about. Okay. Now what about for negative integers? So n is negative 1, negative 2, and if you're curious about those type of functions, we're thinking about like y equals to 1 over x, and this is y equals to 1 over x squared, right? Remember your exponents. Okay, well, what happens in these situations? Now, if, if you're not sure again, I'm going to ask you to graph them out. So I'll bring out my graphing calculator. Let's just graph these out and let's see what happens. 1 over x, we'll graph. So what happens when it gets to positive infinity? Seems to be getting closer to zero. Also to negative infinity, seems to be closer to zero. And let's just double check and see what happens when I put a square on the end. So, oh, same thing, towards zero, towards zero. If you're thinking about the cube, we'll erase this and put a cube there. And let's see what, oops, oh, that's not good. One divided by x cubed. Let's graph this once again towards zero. So notice that when I take the limit, so what happens when it gets closer and closer to positive or negative infinity, in this case, the value is zero. And like what I have here, the limit of x approach to infinity of x to the power of negative three can be written as the limit as x approach to infinity of one over x to the power of three. And of course, if you put infinity into x, infinity l cubed is still really big. I'll say extremely big. And what's that equal to? Well, that's just 0. Okay. Now, notice that multiplying by a positive con constant does not affect these limits. But multiplying by a negative constant then, of course, reverses the signs. So if you look at some examples here, example number one now, if I ask you to find each of the following limits if they exist, remember those limit properties with last day? We can factor out the two, and now you're just asked to find the limit as x approach to infinity of x to the power of six. This whole thing we know from above, that is equal to infinity. Well, two times infinity, well, that's just equal to infinity. So there's your answer. Over here for part B, we will take the negative 12 out. We'll take the limit as x approach to negative infinity of x to the power of 6. And once again, from above, we know this is an even power. So when I take it to the value of negative infinity for x, let's look back up here. 
If you said this equals to positive infinity, you're correct. So that's negative 12 times positive infinity. Of course, 12 times positive infinity is just infinity, but you have this negative in front, so your answer here is negative infinity. So I hope those are okay. And this is what we also did in Math 11. We talked about the end behavior, and that's what we're doing when we're saying what happens when x approaches to infinity and negative infinity. Okay, it's called the end behavior. We also stated that there was an end behavior model so that if we look at a polynomial, the only term that really matters here is the term of the highest degree. So the one with the largest exponent. Everything else just really is so small that it doesn't take into account. So for example, in part C, if I asked you what the actual limit as x approached to infinity of 7x to the power 5 minus 4x squared plus 1, you're correct, where you can just put this in and plug it in. 7 times infinity to the power of 5 minus 4 times infinity to the power of 2 plus 1. But which term dominates? It's this largest term here that dominates because if you think about taking infinity to the power of 5, that's much, much bigger than infinity all squared or the number 1. So in essence, we don't have to worry about those other terms we can just focus in on this term and say, oh yeah, that must be infinity. Okay. Similarly, if I were to use that in this one here, using the end behavior model, which term should I focus on? Right. So by the end behavior model, you'll be thinking, well, the only term that matters really is negative 18x to the power 8. And of course, I can factor out the negative 18, take the limit, approach to infinity of x to the 8. And what I have here is, well, negative, so that's infinity. And of course, that just equals to negative infinity. Okay, so that's what the end behavior model describes. Look at the largest power of x, and that's what dominates. Okay. And we can do the same thing with E, F, and G underneath. Just look at the highest power and let it dominate. So we'll take a look at this. If I were to use the end behavior model once again, we are looking at the highest power. The highest power would be 5x squared on the top, we won't have to worry about anything else, and 10x on the bottom. I guess what I'll do is I'll separate the limit now, x approach to infinity of, let's say, 5 times x squared, like that. And I'll divide this by, and once again, I just distributed the limit into the fraction. Okay. So you might be thinking, well, the 5 halves equal, or sorry, 5 tenths equal the 1 half, that's good. You may be thinking, well, x squared and the x cancel out. So sure, you're just left with the limit as x approached to infinity of x. And of course, that just equals to 1 half times infinity. And that answer here is infinity. Okay. Now, just as an aside, if you were to do this by algebra, okay, using algebra, and this is what I showed you also earlier on in Math 11 honors, we would be actually factoring out the highest power of x. So I'd say factor out largest power of x. So if we do that, and this is perfectly fine as well, we would factor out the x squared. We'd have 5, and this would be 3 over x squared. And on the bottom, the highest power of x is the x, so we'll factor that out, and we'll have 10 minus 20 over x. Now, the special thing about this method here is remember whenever you're dividing by a x with an exponent in the denominator, well, guess what? These terms just go towards 0, right? When x is really, really big, infinity is really, really big. 3 divided by a really, really big number is 0. Similarly, over here, 20 divided by a really, really big number is 0. So what you can see now is I can cancel this and you're just left with the limit of x approach to infinity of x on the top. And we've got 5 plus 0, which is just 5. And on the bottom, we have a 10. 
and this is pretty much the same as what we had over here. And of course, 5 tenths is just 1 half, so that's the limit of x approach to infinity of x, and that's just equal to infinity. So in the end, you still get the same thing, so both ways work. But once again, the end behavior model just says, look at the largest power and use that. However, what I just did with the algebra is the, I guess, more proper way of doing things. Okay? So I'd like you now to try the same thing for F and then G. Okay? Use whichever one you want. Maybe I'll use the end behavior for F and I'll use the algebra for G. But I'd like you to try this on your own right now. So stop the video if you're watching online. Try it on your own and then come back. All right, so those are my answers. Uh, I used the N behavior model for F and algebra for G. You can go back and switch them around. You should get the same answers both ways, okay? Feel good about this? Then let's just turn the page and let me just summarize this for you. Whenever you're dealing with rational functions, remember those are fractions, okay, of the form P over Q, meaning you have a polynomial on the top in the numerator and another polynomial in the, bottom, in the denominator, if the degree of the numerator is always more, then when you take the limit, what happens is you always end up with an x, you'll apply the infinity, and you'll get the answer of infinity. So that's like one of those look at previous examples. So that's example, I guess, e on the previous page. If the polynomial top is less than q, that would be example f. Notice what we had here was the answer was 0, so look at example f and if the degree of the polynomial is the same then the limit is actually going to be a number and i'm going to use the number a over b but a and b represent the coefficients of the highest powers of x okay and of course in this case when the degree is the same this limit always approaches some sort of constant and if you look back at when we did the rational expressions and all that kind of stuff you'll see this exact same summary. Okay. And a property that comes out of this is if the limit as x approaches to positive infinity or negative infinity equals some sort of constant, that's the c, some constant, the line y equals to c is, and this is what we call a horizontal asymptote. Remember those dotted lines? Yes, well, there are vertical ones and horizontal ones. And it says a function here can have a maximum of two horizontal asymptotes. 
one for positive infinity and one for negative infinity. And I'll show you an example graphically um, really quickly. If I have here is my x and y axes, okay, x and y, you might have a graph that looks kind of like this. Ooh, okay, and notice here then when x approaches to positive infinity, you know, you've got this asymptote up top. Okay, and then also when x approaches to negative infinity, you've got this one that approaches the bottom. So here's an example of two separate asymptotes. Okay, so two different horizontal asymptotes. And remember, to find them, all you need to do, and let's just remind yourself, to find horizontal asymptotes, All you need to do is find the limit as x approaches to infinity of the function and or the limit of x approaches to negative infinity of the function. If they're the same, of course, there's one. But if there are two different answers, then, of course, there are two. So I'd like you to take a look at example number two now. And I ask you with this rational function, find all the vertical and horizontal asymptotes. All right. So let's take a look together. I'm going to ask you to find the vertical ones, first of all. And this is from regular math 11. I hope you remember where the vertical asymptotes occur. Those are like your non-permissible values. So you look at the denominator, and you want to set the denominator equal to 0. x minus 4 equals 0, therefore x equal to 4. There's your vertical asymptote. If you're curious about the horizontal one now, well, I just told you above how to find them. So take the limit as x approach to infinity and I guess negative infinity as well. This one I'll do properly with the proper algebraic techniques, which means you should actually factor out the highest power of x. So look at how I'm doing this now. I hope this is straightforward to you guys. The x will cancel out. Then you have the limit as x approach to infinity of this whole thing. And then, of course, you can apply infinity to the function. Of course, that's 0, that's 0. So I believe all you have left here is 1. And there you go. So therefore, y equals to 1 is your horizontal asymptote. Now, to double check if that's the only one, what you should also do is actually calculate the limit as x approach to negative infinity. I won't do this because all the algebra is the same. And what you'll get now is the limit as x approach to negative infinity is 1. Well, that's just 1, so it's the same thing. Okay. Only one horizontal asymptote. All right, so once again, more limits, limits with x approaching to infinity. That's what we've done so far. Okay. If you want to turn the page, I'm going to show you a few more interesting ones. And you're thinking back in chapter 7, we looked at something called piecewise functions. Oh, yes, all that absolute value stuff. And how I made you write it as separate functions. Well, Hopefully this is now where you know why I did it that way. So now I'm going to say, let's determine if limits of the following functions exist at given values. Now, usually these functions are always fine and dandy, except at one particular point. Okay, And usually for calculus, we always look at that interesting particular point. But before we begin, let's just quickly review for limit of x to exist, what must we ensure? Well, I hope you remember that we have to ensure that the limit from the left, the left-hand limit, must equal to the right-hand limit. So that's what we need to be careful of. And remember the absolute value function? Well, if we write it as a piecewise function, remember it's equal to x if x is greater or equal to 0, and negative x if x is less than 0. Don't forget, or if you do forget, remember, please review chapter 7. 
So if I ask you to find the limit as x approached to 0, we need to actually calculate two different things. We need to calculate the limit as x approaches to 0 from the left of the function. And we also should calculate the limit as x approached to 0 from the right of that function. And if the limit is supposed to exist, hopefully these two numbers are the same. So just like how we did before, what are you going to replace the absolute value of x with when x is close to 0 from the left? So looking at these two choices up here, which one should I choose, the top or the bottom? And if you said the bottom, you are correct, because 0 from the left means that it's less than 0. So let's plug it into here, this function. When I plug in 0 to that, that's negative 0. Well, that's just 0. Okay. Similarly, for this one down here, now, what's the limit as x approaches to 0 from the right? What would I replace the function with? And if you said regular x, that's correct. That just becomes 0. Well, that's just also 0. So I'll say since... The limit from the left of the absolute value of x equals to the limit from the right of the absolute value of x, then the limit of x approach to 0 of the function exists, meaning there's an answer, and is equal to 0. make this look nicer. There you go. Okay. Now for part B, the functions are already written in piecewise function form, so it should be pretty straightforward for you. Go ahead, please, and try that one on your own. Once again, find the limit from the left, and then also find the limit from the right. Go. Make sure you make the right replacement. This is to the left, so I'm going to use x minus 1. This is to the right. So I'll do this. Okay, minus 5. So 9 minus 5 is 4. And I'm going to ask you, are these the same? They are definitely not the same. So I'll say something like this. Since the limit as x approach to 3 from the left okay, does not equal to the limit as x approach to 3 from the right, then what I can say now is the limit at 3, which is what I'm looking for, right? The limit at 3 does not equal exist. There you go. Okay? So once again, for piecewise functions, just be careful. Look at it from the left. Look at it from the right. Make sure you replace it with the correct thing, and the rest should be fine. Okay? I'm going to ask you to do the same thing here for parts uh, number four. But once again, I'm going to help you look at this function because note once again that the absolute value of x can be written as a piecewise function. And therefore, your actual function g of x should also or can also be written as a piecewise function. So notice g of x can be written the following way. I'll have 3x plus 2 over x. And this is true when x is greater or equal to 0. And then we also have 3x plus 2 over negative x if x is less than 0. Okay? So once again, now notice here we have two different uh, functions depending on where you are for x. And now I'd like you to take a look at that and use the appropriate function to evaluate each of the limits.
Okay. So go ahead and try that on your own once again. And I'll write out my answers, but if you're watching online, stop the tape and try these things on your own. Okay. Approaching infinity, I think I'm going to use the function on top. 3x plus 2 over x. And then this one, I'm just going to use the end behavior model. Just makes life a little bit easier. Okay. And I'm going to have the limit as x approach to infinity of 3x over x. The x crosses out, so I think the answer is just 3. Okay. Uh, this one will be the limit as x approach to negative infinity, so I better use the bottom function this time. Once again, the end behavior model requires us to take a look at the highest powers. And once again, this is now negative x on the bottom. Okay. And then, of course, if I were to cancel, I get here negative 3. Okay. So this is the example where you have two different asymptotes. All right. We can take a look at approaching 0 from the right. Of course, that means I take the top function and behavior again. Oh, look. Oh, okay, careful. This one we can't use end behavior. Okay, notice this is not asking for what happens when x approaches to infinity. So you must go ahead and use that algebraic method. That's the only method that works. Okay, so use algebra for sure. So I'm going to ask you to factor out the highest power of x, we get 3 plus 2 over x, and then we get x on the bottom. This is nice because they just cancel out. We have the limit as x approach to 0 from the right of the function 3 plus 2 over x. Now notice what happens here, 2 divided by 0, that's positive. This term actually goes to not 0, but infinity. So 3 plus infinity means that the answer is infinity. Last one here, the limit as x approach to 0 from the left. Well, what happens in this case? I'm going to ask you to now calculate the limit as x approach to 0 from the left. And of course, we have to replace it with the function negative x using algebra again. I want you to factor out the highest power of x. Negative x. Let's cancel these. We're left with the limit of x approach to 0 from the left of 3 plus 2 over x divided by negative 1. And of course, if we were to plug in infinity here, or sorry, 0 there, you get infinity. 3 plus infinity is infinity, but you're dividing by negative 1, so this actually equals to negative infinity. Okay? And there you have it, some examples of how to find limits as x approach to infinity, how to find limits of some piecewise functions. Okay. Got a little bit more to take a look at today, so if you can carry on with me to page 4, I want to show you how we can use radical functions, especially this idea of the end behavior model for functions involving radical and especially these ones where you have the radical of the x squared term. Now notice here, the radical of x squared actually equals to not just x, but the absolute value of x. Because when you take the square root and square functions, they are inverse of each other. So you should get back what you started. But if I took a number like negative 5 and I squared it, I get positive 25. Right, so I'll take that. I'll square it. That gives me positive 25. But if I take the square root of that, I get really 5, not negative 5. Well, really, I should get plus or minus. So to combat that, we just say this doesn't equal x, but it equals to absolute value of x. Remember, the absolute value of x, of course, means that if it's equal to x, if x is greater than equal to 0, and it's equal to negative x if x is less than 0. So that's the same idea. Okay. Now this comes in handy when we do these limit types of questions. And if you're doing the AP Calc exam, I guarantee you'll see something like this. Well, we're going to use that um, algebraic ways. So once again, your goal is to factor out the highest power of x. 
In this case, the highest power of x is the x squared that's inside the actual root, which is fine. We can do the same thing. So that's what we have. And on the bottom, we factor up the x, and we have 4 minus 9 over x. Remember, to continue to simplify this, we can take the limit as x approaches to infinity. We'll then separate the square root. And now we have a decision to make. What is the apps, or sorry, what is the root of x squared equal to when x approaches to infinity? And we just told you that equals to the absolute value of x. But the absolute value of x can be written as a piecewise function as x and negative x. So which one should we use? The top x or the bottom negative x? And because we know that this is going to infinity, that means x is bigger or equal to zero, we use the top. So now this is the key step, replace the root of x squared with x. And now continue to simplify and solve. So the x's cancel out. We have here the limit of x approach to infinity of root 1 plus 6 over x squared over 4 minus 9 over x. This stuff becomes 0, becomes 0, so you're left with root 1 on the top with a 4. So there you have it. Your limit as x approach to infinity is equal to 1 over 4. Okay. Part B is exactly the same, so I'd like you to try that one on your own. Go. Once again, here's the decision you need to make. What does this get replaced with when it's negative infinity? And if you chose negative x, take a bow. Congratulations. your answer. Okay. I want to just show you two other things, two little things. Okay, They might come in handy one day, I'm not too sure. They're kind of odd things, but I think it's good for you to know. And after that, you've got a lot of homework that you can try on the back page of these limits. Okay, So I really do want you to try these, please. See if you can get the actual answers. Alright, last thing, or last two things. I want to show you a new function. It's called it has these two brackets, okay? Bracket, 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 bracket. It's called the greatest integer function. So the greatest integer function is the largest integer less than or equal to x. So when I'm asking you, what's the greatest integer larger or equal to 5? I hope you'll say 5. Or not larger, less than or equal to 5. 5.5, 5. well, which integer is less than or equal to that? That's also 5. Pi. Well, pi is like 3.14. So what integer is less than or equal to 3.14? So that'd be 3. And the last one here, negative 3 over 4. Which integer is less than or equal to negative 3 over 4? Don't say 0, because that's actually more, right? On the number line, if you look at this, negative 3 quarters, 0 is more. So the one that's less is actually negative 1. Now visually, if you're curious what this looks like, this is what the actual function looks like. Here's x, here's y. So when x is going from 0 to 1, like this, 
but once at one, it jumps up to one. All right, all these values, then two. This is what they call like a step function. Two. Okay, and if it's negative, that's two negative, one negative, two. So here my question is, find the limit as x approaches to 6 of this greatest integer function. Yes. What are some of your guesses? 6? 5? Don't know? Don't care? Well, let's take a look. How do we find limit as x approach to a number? Well, once again, take the limit as x approach to 6 from the right and find the limit as x approach to 6 from the left. Now remember, the greatest integer function is the largest integer less than or equal to x. So if I plug in 6.00001, the largest integer less than or equal to that is, of course, 6. If I plug in, let's say, 5.999, the largest integer less than or equal to that is 5. So what's the limit if the two from the left and the right do not equal? Well, therefore, in this case, the limit as x approaches to 6, because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit do not exist, or not, sorry, do not equal each other, this does not exist. Tricky. Okay. One last thing I want to show you here, something called the squeeze there, and I'll quickly get it done, and then I'll let you work on things in class. Suppose we have three different functions, okay? f of x, g of x, h of x. f is the smallest, g is the middle, h is the largest, and it's when x is near a, we have the limit of the lowest function or smallest function equals to this number L. That's just a constant. And the highest function, the limit is also a constant, the same constant. Well, then the question is, what do we know about the limit as x approach to A of that middle function? So visually, let me try to show you what's going on. Okay, draw please. Here's the lowest function, here's f of x. And let's put this value right here, a. Then we have h of x, highest function. But look what happens when it gets closer and closer to a. It actually has the same, oops, it has the same limit. So if I got some function, which I call g of x now, which is kind of in between f and h, so it could be up and down, who knows what's going on. But what happens when it gets closer and closer to a? If you said that, hey, it also has to equal to this value of L, you're correct. So this is what they call the squeeze theorem. Okay, I've got a function below. I've got a function above. And at this value of A, they come close together. They squeeze the middle function, so it has to have the same limit. As an example of this, I'll say show that this limit equals to 0. Well. This sign of 1 over x prime is really confusing, tricky, okay, question mark. But hopefully you remember that sign is a function that oscillates back and forth, back and forth. We did this in the 11 honors class. Hopefully you also remember that the sign value can only go between 1 and negative 1. So really what you're saying here is that this can be the limit as x approached to 0, okay, of the function uh, x squared and this sine x as the lowest value could become negative 1 and then over here we have here the limit as x approach to 0 of x squared of the other part of the sine x well, what's the maximum it could be that could be 1 so this is the lowest okay this is the highest okay. and my question now is what is this actually equal to well at 0, when you do this, we get, well, you plug it in, right? 
zero, that equals zero. And over here, you plug it in, what do we get? We get also zero. So notice in this case, I've said that the limit as x approached to zero equals zero in both the lowest and the highest case. Well, if you think about what we can have with the actual function itself, the actual function itself is in between the highest and lowest. And we know that the limit of the lowest and the highest is both zero. So what must this limit equal to? Well, that's zero. Okay, so I can say something like this by the squeeze theorem. The limit of this crazy function x squared sine of 1 over x must also equal to 0. Okay, and that's something that you might see somewhere down the road. Right, get to work, we're done.